glad to have you. Uh, maybe if you don't mind, maybe tell me and whoever else listening a little about yourself, like how old you are, how long, how did you become a Jehovah Witness? How long you been a Jehovah Witness? Just so that way I have a little background of who you are. Okay, I'm 67. I was raised as a JW. But uh, I didn't decide to become one until I was 16. Okay. Um, now, when you were raised that, Ben, uh, like, is it like from your parents? And have they been witnesses from their parents? How, how far back does that go, Ben? Um, yes, my mother was raised as a witness. Uh, so it goes back four generations as being of being witnesses okay and in your area where you're out in australia is that um what's what's a lot of like the different groups of faith out there where you're at uh it's not a particularly uh, religious city yes the, the city used to be called the city of churches years ago but it's not particularly that way anymore um where what city is that adelaide what is it adelaide oh okay okay cool cool and, um but it, it's a very um non-religious now people have been have turned away from religion a lot yeah all right, Ben. Well, uh, thank you for sharing very much. Just at least that way, I, cause I, did, I actually didn't know how old. I don't think you told me how old you were and appreciate that. And you reached out to me and wanted this discussion. And so I'll just kind of just uh, follow your lead. You, If I remember correctly, you wanted to share some things with me that if I remember correctly, you said I've never heard before. And so I'm going to let you lead it and I'll just kind of respond. Okay. It's probably... I don't think a lot of people have really considered this, what I'm going to say today. Uh, something that very few people, even a lot of witnesses, would not have con really considered it. But before we start, can I ask you a couple of questions so I get a bit of a feel about where you stand on some things? Sure, go ahead. Um, in Hebrews 6 verse 18, it tells us that God cannot lie. You agree with that? Yes. Okay. Second Timothy three sixteen says that all Scripture is inspired of God. So you agree with that? When we're talking about the Bible, correct? Yep. Yep, I would agree. Yep. Okay. So if there appears to be a contradiction in the Bible, how do you handle it? Um. Well, there's a lot of people who say there's contradictions i don't believe the bible contradicts the bible as i'm sure you don't either yeah so what, what i'm saying is if you come across a, cu a couple of scriptures which appear to contradict each other how do you handle it well anything i ever do for myself is i always want to read things in context read whatever passage i may be looking at verses before it uh verses after it Especially if the author say something, saying something Paul wrote, uh, maybe Paul wrote about that same topic in a different epistle and addresses that to give confirmation and clarity. And so um, you always want to make your, you just want to go with what the scripture says. And, uh, and sometimes there are things in the Bible that I don't understand. I don't call it a contradiction. It's just things I don't understand. Okay. So when you talk about context, you talk you you look at the scriptures around the text you're looking at. Do you also look at the whole chapter? Yeah, sure. The whole book. Sure. And what about the rest of the Bible? Sure. Okay, so context has got to got to fit in with everything that the Bible says. You agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you always go with the immediate context. Yeah. And then you would go with to the context of that particular book. And then you'd go with the context that surrounds mm -hmm. that book, that all that would confirm. Okay. Now, when you're looking at a Bible that's been a translation, 
Do you ever think that a translator should stay by the rules of grammar or should they allow theology to influence the way they translate? Oh, well, that, that could be a whole can of worms because the same... It is. If you're going to talk about that, we could, you know, jump no, on... No, I'm not world. talking about... Uh, no, 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 I'm just saying you could, jump on, you could jump on the New World Translation, you could jump on Catholic translations, you could jump on... Uh, yeah, I'm... Uh, Smith. So, I mean, how about we just stick with what the text says and then you go from there? Uh, yeah. The text says it, but the trouble is... I'm just, I was trying to rephrase I'll, the question. I'll, I'll even make it easier for you. We can just read just a New World Translation. I'm completely cool with that. No, uh, uh, I just wanted to, to clarify the question, if I can. Should a translator allow theology to influence their translation, or should they follow established rules of grammar when translating? Well, since I'm not one who is a translator, I don't know all the li linguistics of what would go in it, but of course they shouldn't. Um, but when you're looking at the Bible, there's a lot that goes into it. So instead of just, I don't want to be rude, let's just get to your argumentation of any text you want to prove, um, because I'm sure you're not a Bible translator scholar, and I would never claim myself to be a Bible translator scholar either. Okay. So when you talk about the nature of God, what do you mean by the nature of God? His essence, his being, his holiness, eternity, um, everlasting, everlasting, uh, always being, right? We're they're, a part they're, of creation. Yep. they're all qualities, but then that's not the nature. Like we are human by nature. That's so true. If you talk about, God is if by you talk nature. About, God is by nature holy. God is by nature eternal, right? No, that's not nature. If you talk about us humans, we have our nature is hum is humanity. Sure. So, how about, what, how about you? You tell me what then you would say God's okay. nature is. That's what I'm going to get get to when I when I get into to discussing. Sure. Now, a couple of other questions. If you're going, if you're talking to somebody for the very, very first time about the Trinity, who knows nothing about it, what scriptures would you go to? Give me two two scriptures that you would pull off the top of your head to go to to try to explain the Trinity, to try to explain if if Jesus is God. Just Jesus is God or the Trinity? Is Jesus God? Well, I would go to John 1 and Colossians 1. Okay. That's interesting. Because originally I would have gone to John 1, 3 and Colossians 1, uh, 15, but not anymore, I don't. You, My first you, go, if so somebody there, was to ask me. Sorry, you would go there why? For what? Why would you go there? I would go there because John 1, 3 and Colossians uh, 115 show that Jesus Jesus is not God, but I won't talk about them today. That they're for another another discussion, another time. Sorry, can you just clarify? So, you actually think John 1 3 would teach Jesus is not God? Yep, but well, we, we won't go there today. We can, can we go there on another occasion? Wow, that's like the most obvious verse that he is God. That's interesting. Okay, but can we go there on another occasion? Well, I'm following your lead right now, so you go okay. ahead. So the two scriptures I would go to to show that Jesus is not God is Genesis 1.1 1, 1 and Exodus 6.4. Uh, oh, interesting. The, Exodus 6.4 or Deuteronomy 6.4? Uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 and Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, fair enough. Now, the reason why I do that is I've read a lot of books about the Trinity from, uh, I don't know if you've, uh, just see if I can find their, their names. Uh, I had a list of people that I've read, read books on. Um, a book called The Forgotten Trinity by James White. Okay. Uh, I just want to, I can't find. Oh, the, uh, 
the other book by Robert Bowman called um, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus, and the Book of John. Okay. And, and a book called Jesus as God, the New Testament Use of the Theos in Reference to Jesus by Murray Harris. They're quite interesting books, but I found they all make the same mistake. They don't understand the meaning of the word God. And that's okay. why and that's why I go to I, I now go to uh, Genesis one one and Deuteronomy six four. Okay. Because the first thing the first thing we need to do in is establish a timeline. When I asked you about you to prove Jesus is Jesus God, you went to the New Testament. Now, the New Testament writers were all Jews. They came from a very Jewish background. Except for Luke. Uh, he was also a Jew. Okay, no, but okay. Um, if you look at... Uh, I've got a, it. I'll, I'll grant you; it's not a big deal to me. I don't agree with you, but it doesn't really yeah. matter. Even if they are all Jews, I'll, it's fine. Because fine. Go the, ahead. The, keep the, going. Keep going. It's fine. The, the Bible actually says that the, the, his word was passed to the Jews, or only only the Jews. But anyway, besides yeah. that, okay, good. Keep going. It's fine. Keep going. Their background is that of being um, Jews. So, what did the Jews understand by the word God? We, we, we need to build a timeline. If you're going to build a house, do you start with the roof, the walls, or the foundation? Start with this cornerstone. Yeah, but the cornerstone's got to have a foundation, doesn't it? The foundation it, is built on the cornerstone. You start with the cornerstone. That's where you start. Okay, so you've got to, you got to, put, a, you got to put a foundation down first before you can put up walls you can put on a roof. Sure. Okay. So if you're going to the New Testament, you're going to the roof. You haven't so, built up so the how walls. About this? So if I'm going to talk about who Jesus Christ is in the Old Testament, where do you go? If you want to talk about going with the Jews, you're going to talk about who Jesus Christ is because you asked me the question, where would I go to show Jesus is God? So if you're yep. going to say we don't go to the New Testament, then where would you go in the Old Testament to show who Jesus is? Genesis 1.1 1, 1 and Deuteronomy uh, 6.4. So in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, tell me about Jesus. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, where's the mention of Jesus there? That's the nothing. point. There isn't any. You, well, you, you, can't, understand. You, can't use, you can't use Genesis 1 to try to talk about Jesus right there. Oh, you can. Because you've got to understand who who God is before you can talk not, about Jesus. Not, not with your argumentation. Like you asked me a question. Let's just rewind for a second. Yeah. You asked me a question. Where would I go for two scriptures about proving Jesus is God? The revelation yep. of who Jesus Christ is as the Son of God, as the Son of Man, as the Logos, as the one to come, the Messiah. This is all revealed revelation in New Testament. There are hints and shadows and prophecies of the Messiah to come in the Old Testament. But the revelation of who Jesus Christ is is not there directly until we get to the New Testament. So what I asked, what I answered you is correct. You don't go to Genesis 1-1 and talk about Jesus without the New Testament. You do if you want to establish who God is. Okay. So okay. You go, imagine imagine you, we don't have a New Testament. And mm -hmm. you're Genesis 1 want to talk about Jesus Christ. Do you think anybody would take you seriously? I would talk about who God is. Okay, so now we're talking about who God so, is, but before but we were talking about is, Jesus. The because Trinitarians say Jesus is God. True, okay. but that's New Testament revelation that we have that, okay. that, that bases that that understanding. Okay. Trinitarians say Jesus is God. Correct. The Bible teaches that too. But now to, to understand that, you have to, you have to understand what the word God means and who God was in the Bible in the Old Testament. Okay. 
So why don't you give what you believe the meaning of God in the Old Testament from Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 6 4 that you were talking about, Gen- or Deuteronomy 6 4. Deuteronomy 6, 6 4. Yeah. Now, the basic meaning of the word God to the Jews, to the, he- to the ancient Hebrews, actually meant a powerful one, or a mighty one, or a strong one. That's the meaning of the word. From? Where do you get your definitions from? Uh, strong. Uh, Strong's Hebrew lexicon. Yeah, and, and, and uh, that's what you just got from those exact words from the Strong's. Yep. Yep. Uh, let, me, let me go to the other, the other, the other places. Um, because to my knowledge, from what I've looked up Strong's before, it says supreme being, God, gods, goddesses, has the issue of rulers, judges, mighty ones. Um, yeah. They say there you go. Variety, has a variety of definitions. And always based on what you would look at in context is how we'd understand how that word Elohim, which is the Hebrew word for God, how we'd understand that. Elohim is one of the words for God. There's three Hebrew words in the Bible for God. Okay, what are the other two you're going off of? I, I, I would agree. I'm not disagreeing, but what are the other two? El, which is a, a, an abbreviation of Eloah. Eloah is the main word for God. Uh-huh. It's, let me just find my notes here. I'll tell you how many times it's it's used. Uh huh. It's not it's not used very many. Yeah, Elohim is used a lot more. Oh yeah, a great deal more. I've got over fifty pages of notes here. I'm trying to sort through to find them for you. Okay, I thought you would have been ready for this, so you're surprised. I me. did. I, I um. I had all my notes ready, and then I lost them and had to start again. Okay. Um, oh, the other things I used the, the the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew Lexicon, and oh. um, okay, the Eloah is used uh, about forty times in the Bible only. Uh, Elohim is used 2,340 times. Earl is used 245 times. Earl is the abbreviated form of the word Eloah. And Elohim is the plural form of, of those two. Okay. So when you look at the, if you look at the... How many times do you say Aloha was used about? E-L-O-A-H is used, uh, look at my notes, 60 times in the Old Testament, 40 it's times. About, it's actually about 250 yeah. from what, what I've seen online. I have my notes in front of me, so a little bit more uh, than what you thought. No, Eloah, E-L-O-A-H, is yeah. found 60 times in the Old Testament, 40 times in the book of Job. Earl, okay, just so EL. It's about 250 and about 2,500 times in the plural. So it depends on what you're looking at, but keep going. So, um, uh, Earl is used 245 times. But the basic meaning of the word is mighty one, strong one, or powerful one. That's according to the Brown Driver Briggs. Hebrew lexicon, uh, Strong's Hebrew lexicon, okay. um, the Catholic Encyclopedia. Okay. So, uh, how that, so, that, how it, so how does that build your case for against the Trinity? That's what I'm – we, we can go back and forth on definitions because I would agree with okay. you, most of these things you're saying. Because it, it's not limited to, to God. El and Eloa are not limited to the Almighty. They're limited to humans. Um, they're limited to use of uh, uh, natural phenomena. It's used of angels. Yeah, so is Elohim. So, it's true. Yeah, no, no disagreement. Always context. Right. It is. It's context. So the, the main thing about Elohim is that it doesn't mean a divine one. 
It does not mean a holy one. It does not mean a righteous one or any of those other adjectives. Okay. All that all that Earl and Elohim mean is to the original writers of the Hebrew, all it means is a mighty one or a powerful one or a strong one. Actually, it has a lot more meaning than that because it can also mean false gods. It can also no, mean that, mighty ones or rulers or judges or princes. It can also mean no. supreme being. Yeah, it does. Hang, yeah, hang it does. on. Okay. You're making up stuff now, Ben. Hang on. Um, Kelly, when I'm talking, can you let me finish talking before you butt in, please? Well, I I have been letting you talk. I've been very but, kind but, to you, Ben. So don't, don't think I'm not. But if you're going to say something but, that's accurate, I'm going to make a quick comment. So keep going. But can you wait till I finish talking before you make the comment? Ben, you've been talking for a while, bro. Keep going. Uh, you keep butting in when I'm trying to make my point. Ben, make your point then. Okay. The word uh, translated as God doesn't mean the other things. It can mean a ruler. It can, it can apply to a ruler, but it doesn't mean a ruler. It can apply to an angel, but it doesn't mean angel. The word actually just means a mighty one or a powerful one or a strong one, but it can be applied to judges and rulers and other things and false gods. So a false god is a, is a false mighty, mighty one. Now, if you look through the context of the Bible, you see that the words for um, God is used for to describe a judge. It describes Moses. Moses was appointed as God to Pharaoh. Yep. So what they're saying is that he became a mighty one over Pharaoh. He wasn't a, a deity that was worshipped, but to become a God to Pharaoh means he became a mighty one or a powerful one or a strong one against Pharaoh. The May judges I make a of, comment? Yes. So when you're looking at Exodus 7, 1, it says he was made God to Pharaoh. It's talking about an authority and what Mo Moses was being used by God to bring judgment. So yes, yes, in context, that's correct. He's not being God. He's being used in authority to bring judgment against Pharaoh. Okay. Yeah, he's using an authority because that comes down to the meaning of the word God, a powerful one or a mighty one or a strong one to have that authority to bring judgment against Pharaoh. Let me just bring on the screen for a quick second here. You asked me to have in the background, which I do have, this is yep. from Bible Hub, and these are the meanings, divine, divine being, exceedingly God, God, gods, goddess, godly, gods, great, judges. So when we're talking about this, of course, everything is going to be dependent upon how it's going to be used in its proper context. So we agree with that, Ben. I would like you, if you don't mind, maybe skip to the point where now you want to present your case against the Trinity. Because I don't want a lecture. I want this to actually be an actual discussion. Okay. I'm trying to set the scene here about if you're building a house, you've got to put the foundation down first. To understand what's happening in the New Testament, you have to understand what's happening in the Old Testament. The Hebrew, the, the writers of the New Testament were all Jews. They understood what the word God meant. It didn't, to them, the word God can apply to the Almighty, but overall, it just meant a mighty one. The context always dictates the true meaning of the word, and in every case, if you replace the word God with one of those three terms, a mighty one or a strong one or a powerful one, it always makes sense. The um, Do you want to see proof of how these words are translated into, into other um, meanings? I know how they can be translated, my friend. What I'm really hoping for is this. You're giving me more than what you're – I'm hoping you're going to bring what you claimed. You said you were going to bring something that I've never heard before that's going to refute the Trinity. So far, we've been going through a lecture so far. 
I would like you to like, if you can condense it in a really short time here, present your case of Genesis 1, 1 and Deuteronomy 6, 4, how those verses refute the Trinity. They refute the Trinity because they show that it, the word God is not a being. It, it, the word God doesn't return, doesn't refer to a nature. It doesn't refer to a particular being. It's not restricted to one one individual or one nature of persons. It's quite open. So you can't, in the New Testament, when you read the word God, uh, you can't... Um, it doesn't always apply or well, in the New Testament does because that's what the, the Greeks I'm trying to put in words. The word uh, so that the base of my of my argument is that the word God doesn't refer to a nature. The Trinitarians say that Jesus has a, has a, has a divine nature. The nature of God. He's equal to God, part of God in the Godhead. So they lump God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the word God isn't restricted to that sort of a meaning. It's a very broad meaning of powerful one, strong one, and mighty one. And ex Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 also shows that Jesus cannot be God. Because in there you've got the word ekad, and unlike what Trinitarians try to claim, but they say ekad refers to a, uni a unity of one, make a, a but it doesn't. Ekad refers is the, exactly the same as our English number one, meaning one unit, one thing. So to the Jews. The Almighty Mighty One was one person, and that one person had the name of Jehovah. So, right through the, according to, to the Jews of Jesus' day, when they talked about the Almighty One of the universe, they were thinking about He was the most powerful, strong, mighty one. The existing of one person, one individual, one being, not not three, and only applied to, uh, and his name was Jehovah. Jesus was never referred to as Jehovah. He never took on that name. He has his own name, Jesus. His father is Jehovah, the God of the Jews. Jesus worshipped Jehovah. Jesus worshipped the God of the Jews. He wasn't their God. So it comes, it's got to come down to the meaning of those two things, the meaning of the word God and the fact that uh, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, it tells us that um, he was one God. You want to pull up um, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4? Sorry, are you saying something? Do you want to pull up Deuteronomy 6, verse 4? Before there, do you, are you almost done? I want to give a response. Okay, you give a response. Cool. So what I've heard from you so far is what you believe pertaining to the word akkad, which in a lot of cases in the Old Testament has the meaning of one, singular. But there are many examples where that word one is used as a compound unity. For example, Genesis 1 5 about night and day being one, or uh, night and morning being one day. It talks about the man and the woman being one flesh, Genesis 2 24. It talks about a whole assembly that assembled over 42,000 people in Ezra 264. A whole assembly was together. That talks about a collection together. Um, we see in Ezekiel 37 17 talks about two sticks, a cod being one. Um, in the example of the New Testament, we have the word heis, which is the exact word that 
Deuteronomy 6, 4, when translated all throughout the Old Testament of the Septuagint, when it was being translated in the Greek, all these places where the word ekot is used, the word heis is used. We see in Romans 12, 4 and 5, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 20, Ephesians 2, 14, Galatians 3, 28, uh, all these places where the word heis is used collectively. So to use the argument of Genesis or uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to come against the Trinity is, 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 is completely not even a, a chance because the word ekad there is just talking about God is one. It never says God is one person. Very important as well. In fact, the whole point is showing that God is this one together. And when we look at Genesis chapter one, what's interesting? It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, we know in the New Testament, numerous places, the Father and the Son are involved. First Corinthians 8, 6. We see Jesus. By him, all things are created, invisible or invisible, thrones, principalities, authorities, all these things. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, it says, not even nothing came into existence without Jesus in John 1, 3. Yet in the Old Testament, Isaiah 64, 24, or sorry, 20, 44, 24 says, Jehovah God alone did it. And then if you look at Genesis 1, it says, and God said, let us make man in our image, Genesis 1, 26. Well, I would sure hope you would not say that man was created in the image of angels. So that doesn't make any sense. Then it says, God created man, male and female, man singular, male and female, plural. So we can see how the word God, dependent upon its proper context, can be both singular and plural. So the very fact of what you just shared gets refuted by the very context of those scriptures in, in order. So I'm sorry, uh, uh, Kelly, I have to completely disagree with you, but the word ecad. What a shocker. Because ecad is the exact equivalent to our English word one. It's not the uh, word EK which makes the uh, unity. It's the words which accompany it. Now, in the instance of the two becoming one flesh, it's not the word EK there. It's the word flesh which dictates that, that, uh, the unity because the word flesh is both singular and plural. We don't have fleshes. We only have flesh. And the word one only refers, it's, it's like if I said to you, um, we've got a, I've got a, a bunch of grapes. The word uh, one there replies so, to the one item called, uh, called the bunch. Now, in the bunch, there are lots of little bits of, of grapes which make up the bunch. The same with the word word uh, herd. You have one cow. If you get two cows or three cows, you've then got a herd. So the plur plurality is in the word herd, not in the word one. The Hebrew word which dictates a plur plurality is the word yakid, not ekad. It's the word yakid, which which, which it's actually pronounced. Yeah, it's actually pronounced yakid. But go ahead. Yeah, th there's actually two word, two very similar words. There's yakid and yakad, which are very closely related. Sure. Both having the same same sort of uh, meaning. Yeah, I'm familiar with the other one, but you're you're, you're meaning yakid. I got it. Um, but the the word uh, ekad always refers to one thing. It never refers to a multiple things things put together. Are you even, sure? Even high, absolutely. Absolutely. So when we read, let me just put this on the screen for a second here. I have Greek and Hebrew scholarship that would refute what you've just said about what the word ekad means, but I'm going to fast forward just for a moment here. Let me just get here. So here... It talks about, you just brought up Genesis 2.24. I don't know if you can see this or not, but I'm just going to read it out loud. 
It talks about in Ezekiel 37, 17, about two nations, two separate, distinct nations becoming one together. How do you explain that when that's the Greek or the Hebrew word ekad being in reference to two different nations becoming one together? Because the plurality is in the word nations, not in the word one. I never, the, I added the word nation just so you know. Yeah. I, it says the, the, the two sticks will become one. Yeah. So the plurality is in the words two sticks, not in the word one. And how do, they become, how, do they, how do they become one, Ben? So they become. Uh, Help me out. That's the, that's the Hebrew word ekad. Two nations, two sticks, they become one. Ekad. They become one, How do they do they that? Become, they become one nation. So they're still two different nations, correct, becoming one, right? Yeah, they become one. The two, the two nations become one nation. So that's what you call a compound unity in the Hebrew. Uh, that's the... Compound unity is no. You're talking about one item that becomes one nation. It's not two. The two nations become one. It's still only one singular item. I don't think you're getting it, my friend. What I'm trying to share with you is the people who like yourself as a Jehovah Witness or Unitarians or other groups out there that try so hard to make this word ekad exclusively only singular in its understanding is not correct. Even Jewish people understand this. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to a, a ministry called Jews for Jesus. Highly recommend it. They know the language better than both me and you put together and anyone else probably listening right now. And when they talk about the word ekad and yakid, it shows the distinction of how ekad in these different scriptures demonstrates a unity. The point here is, is that when we look at the word ekad throughout the Old Testament, it is not the card rule that people try to always say it is exclusively just one in number. There are examples of it being of a unity. For example, morning and night, are not two different days. They're one day, but yet they're two distinctions. Morning and night are different things. They're not the same. You've got morning and night, two different distinctions, time frames for the day, but yet they are all still, with both together are one day, this one collective unit. So all that I'm trying to share with you is when you're trying to argue or anyone else is trying to argue that a cod must always mean singular, that is not the way we look at context according to scriptures. What do you what do you understand about the our English word one? When is when is our one a unity? When is what? Sorry, say that last part again. Our English word one. When does that become show unity? Well, like here, for example, I'll just read out loud. I know you probably can't see my screen. I'm just going to read a few scriptures out loud to give you my answer. Okay. In the New Testament, this is where the word heis is used. I was saying earlier, this is the word that's used throughout the Old Testament in the Greek that gave us the word for ekad being um, into heis in the Greek. Paul says in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one heis in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 2.14, Paul writes, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, both groups, meaning Jews and Gentiles, into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. In Romans 12.5, it says, For we who are many are one body. So we are many, a part of one body in Christ, Individually, members one of another. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 12, 20 says, For even as the body is one, yet many members, all the members of the body, though are many, are one body, 
so also is Christ. But now there are many members, but one body. My point is, is that just like how we look at the word God, as you talked about earlier, given different definitions and looking at scripture, when we're looking at the word one, whether Old or New Testament, we always have to understand what's the context of what's being stated. When somebody tries to force a meaning into Deuteronomy 6, 4, and it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It doesn't say anything after that. It just says the Lord is one. So to force the meaning, to say that means there's only one personage, well, that goes against Genesis 1, 26. That goes against Genesis 19, 24. That goes against Isaiah 48. And then you get in the New Testament, about Jesus and the Father, I mean, there is clear scriptures in the New Testament that Jesus is called God. So unless you want to openly call, be called a polytheist, which I don't think you want to be called that, even though I believe you are, that's the conclusion you have to come to. Well, actually, I'm a, I'm a molar, molarity. The Bible is not a, a um, monotheistic book. The Bible is not a polytheistic book the bible is a monolarity mon now that is educate me on that word molarity mol how do you spell that mon monolarity monolarity how do you spell that m-o-n-o -O, um i'm trying to think uh, l-a-r-t-y Monolarity. Yeah. Is that is that a word that we can actually Google, or is that just something you're talking you can, about? You can you can you can Google. Um, you can find it on the on Google if I spelled it right. All right it actually it means. Okay. It actually means it actually means the belief in many gods, but the worship of only one. Wow, that's not good. There are many many gods. That exist, but we are to worship only one. Now, earlier on, we we were talking about the word Elohim, and you said that Elohim applied to angels, it applied to judges, it applied to um, Moses. Well, so in, there are many a, people yeah, called. Yeah, just to clarify, in a proper context, depending upon what's being stated, that's how we'd understand what the word Elohim means. Yes. So there are many things called Elohim. But do you believe that? Let me let me ask you a question. What you just said, so that way I don't misunderstand you. So you said you believe in monolarity, mm -hmm. believe in the existence of many gods, but you only worship one god, which would be obviously in your in your view the Father. So does mm -hmm. that mean when you worship, do you also serve other gods too? No, you only serve one god. You worship and how, serve how one God. How according to the New Testament a bond servant of Jesus Christ if he is a different God? Aren't you then serving a different God? You're serving a different mighty one, not a different God. A different powerful yeah, but one. But if you're a bond servant, which Paul says he is many times, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, he's serving Jesus Christ, and if he is a separate God, that's two gods that he's serving. He's serving the Father and Jesus, who are two different gods, then according to what you're saying. He's serving. I've got to look at. Up That's that polytheism. That's polytheism. Uh, hang on. What's this? What's the text you're talking about? Where the bond servant? Bond servant. Okay, give me one second, and I will. I want to see what that actually that actually says. Sure. Give me one second. All right, Romans 1.1, 1, 1. Paul says he is a bondservant of Jesus Christ. I'll put it on the screen so we can look at it. Give me one second here. Where'd you go? I don't know where you went. What happened here? There we go. And we'll pop this on the screen. So here's an example where Paul is, states he is a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Here's my point. If Jesus is a mighty God, but a different God to you, and you believe in multiple gods, but you still would serve Jesus Christ, well, technically, then you're serving Jesus Christ, who is a mighty God, 
and then you're serving the Father, who's the mighty God, I guess, to you. Um, you're still serving two gods, and according to Scripture, that's called polytheism. You can serve more than one person. If, if When you work for a boss, you serve for that boss. You're a servant um, of your employer. Yeah, that's different, man. That's We, we serve that's God. What, that We serve God. We serve God and we can serve Jesus, but we don't worship Jesus. Yeah, so there are many verses where Jesus is worshipped. Um, but no, the point that I'm bringing up to you is, the point that I'm bringing up to you, Ben, that you're missing, is you're saying you have no problem, which this is completely baffling to me, Ben. That you have no problem acknowledging the existence of many gods, but you want to say you only believe and follow, worship the Father. But Jesus, according to Scripture, we are to be bond servants and followers of Jesus Christ. That's idolatry if Jesus Christ is not the true God. Can you look at that particular Scripture up, that Romans 1.1, in the um, interlinear for me, please. In the interlinear, okay. Give me one second here. Oh, I can't look it up on that. I've got to. Well, give me one more second. Let me find. That was not popping up properly for me here. Now, in the inner linear, as I'm looking at it, it says a servant of Jesus Christ. So it doesn't say the word bond servant. That's what's being recorded there of duios in the New American Standard. But there are other scriptures that use, which I'm sure even says this in the New World Translation. I don't think there should be any disagreement here. The point that I was bringing up to you, just so you understand, Ben, is simply this. You said a moment ago, you don't have any problem with the existence of many gods, but you believe and you only worship, quote unquote, I would say the Father. But yet we're called to be servants, followers after Jesus Christ. So if Jesus Christ is a God, a different God than the Father, well, now you've got you're following the Father and Jesus. That's two gods, and that's polytheism, which that would go directly against. The Old Testament, even, mind you. I mean, do you not see how that's not good? Ben, if you're there still. Ben, can't hear you, man. You still there? Okay, he looks like he's back here. So let's hopefully he's got connection again. Let's see if he works here. All right, so it looks like you're... There we go. Looks like we got you back, Ben. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, you must have got disconnected there, huh? Yeah, uh, something happened and my phone stopped. Uh, just dropped out. Oh, sorry and, about uh, that. Yeah. Uh, it, I got uh, very flustered, flustered when it dropped down because I'm trying to get back on again. All right. Listen, we've kind of gotten a little bit all over the place, a little bit sidetracked here with all kinds of different conversations, and there's so much I want to say what you said. Why don't we just step back a couple of notches, go back to your original presentation that you wanted to really narrow, you know, narrow, uh, down, uh, hammer down, whatever you want to call it, Genesis 1 1. Go back to that because that's where you kind of opened up that you really believe Genesis 1 1 and Deuteronomy. You've already kind of talked about Deuteronomy. What about Genesis 1 1 that you say you believe would refute the Trinity? Uh, I'm just trying to get hear you properly. I can't, I can't quite. Can you speak for a second? I'm trying to adjust my volume. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, that's better. Yeah, I just adjusted my volume so I could hear you. Okay. I, um, now I've got to find 
my notes on my other device. Um, well, I'll just keep just it have so Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. Why? Why do you believe that? Would refute because the because of the word because of the meaning of the word God. Because even you today said that in certain circumstances, the words, the ancient words for God, like El and Elohim, can apply to many different different in instances. You can apply to uh, Moses, you can apply to judges, you can apply to angels. So the word God isn't limited to one being. There isn't one being called God. There's, there are lots of things called God, called gods, and including natural phenomena. I'm just trying to. Um, where is it? I've lost my. There are. Um, the, the word Earl and Elohim are sometimes translated as just powerful or mighty. They're not always translated as uh, as God. Um, I just want to find those examples of those scriptures which show in the Hebrew that uh, I've got a whole list of scriptures here. Okay, the word L. If you look up Genesis 31, Verse 29. So, just question. So, you shared two scriptures right away that you said you believe would refute the Trinity. You asked me two scriptures that I would say I believe the deity of Christ Jesus is God. I shared why. Why do you think Genesis 1 1 wouldn't, would, goes against the Trinity? You haven't answered that yet. I'm kind of curious. It is because of the meaning of the word God. How? Because the word God doesn't apply to one thing. It applies to multiple things. So, then, so, so then maybe it should be in the gods created the heavens and the earth? Is that what you're saying? Nope. It be plural? Nope. nope. It shouldn't be plural. It should, it should be or shouldn't be? It shouldn't be plural. Okay. So then who um, created the heavens and the earth? The source of all creation was the Almighty, Mighty One. Anybody else involved? Yes, his son, a separate individual. Okay. So when the Bible so, says that Jehovah God did it alone, how does that build your case? Because you got to read the context of that, of where that verse is. You talk, talked about context, and when you're looking at those verses in Isaiah 44 or thereabouts, you've got to read the context of the chapters around about that. He is not, he, the context of that is showing that God is talking to the Israelites for a certain reason. The Israelites at that time had strayed from worshipping uh, him as their only God. They started worshipping other gods. Uh, gods of the nations that they started making idols of stone and um, and wood and carving them. So when he says that he was the only one, he, God is referring to the other gods that the Jews were worshiping at that time. But that's a, that's a thing for another for another uh, another occasion. I'm not. I no, want to go. Really. Back. That has to apply to this conversation, Ben, because if you're going to talk about creation. In Genesis 1 1, then I have to give you a response that that actually refutes your argument because you know full well in the New Testament Jesus was with the Father before all of creation, and not one thing, according to John 1 3, not one thing came into existence without Jesus. And if Jesus is a created thing, then that goes against scripture. As you said earlier, it shouldn't be a contradiction. But if Jesus did create all things, that excludes himself from being created, and that would actually point Jesus back to Genesis 1, being the one involved of all of creation as God. No, but Jesus didn't. 
all other things were created through Jesus. There is no other things. There is. The word other does not exist. That's that's another that is a, another another discussion. Even the Watchtower admits that in their study notes of Colossians one sixteen in the literal Greek. If you even read your kingdom, oh, in I, have, I have, you and you can quote it. You keep it. You hold keep on, hold on. That. No, no, no. I'm not misquoting anything. It oh, says you, you do. There is no other there, and the Watchtower says if you just read what it actually says. The reader will believe Jesus is actually the creator and not created. But what do you they just, do? They add the word just, other to change the context. You just misquoted what the that footnote says. Are you by sure? one word. Yep, by one word. You How used one word it? wrong. Go have a look at it. You, uh, what did you say wrong? Tell me. You, were, you used the word will believe. It doesn't say reader, will will have the belief, right? What do they say? It doesn't say, exactly. it do doesn't exactly say, say? will it doesn't say will have the belief. I've got to find it. Uh, well I'm gonna put it on the screen so you better make sure yeah. you quote it right because you're gonna get oh, well, messed up here. Um, I'm I'm quoting it right. You're not you're missing out by one word. Okay. You tell me. You you're putting in the word will is sort of that's not what what the what the um so um, what do they say if the word other is not there, which it's not, just so you know, they openly acknowledge that. Yep. What do they important. say the reader will have the view of? It's it's it is directly implied. Uh, see, this is where the let me quote you directly. Is. Ready? Mm -hmm. A literal rendering of the Greek text would be all things. Guess what they say. Compare that with the kingdom and a linear, which I've done both online and in the, my own possession. They then say such a rendering could give, could give the impression that Jesus was not created, but was what? The creator himself. Okay. Now, That's do you see what, do you see where you, where you misquoted them? I just read word for word. Yes. Then you did. But when you were verbalizing it, you misquoted them. What did I say? You said they will teach. You they inserted will the word will. Conclusion. Could give the impression. Yes, Same that's thing. different. Same thing. No, it's not. Could give Anybody the impression. Anybody who you... reads Colossians 1, 16, 17 for what it says, if you come up with a different conclusion what the Bible says, then you're just not very bright. Reading Colossians 1, 16 says, for by him all things were created. All means all. Nothing came to it existence without him. John 1, 3, that's come into existence. You cannot get any other conclusion other than he is the creator. Oh, you can. Go to, uh, go to, to John 1, uh, first, first Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Okay. Oh, just, just that's first Colossians 1. Just stop for a second. Reading this Colossians a, this, 1, 16, when it says, for by him... All things were created, whether invisible or invisible, thrones, principalities, authorities, all things have been made by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Just remember the word other is not there. It's, so it is, it created it all is, things. The word other is explicitly. Thing according to what you believe, Ben. How does that build your case? Uh, this is very frustrating for me. I know. Because, because you keep you, you won't stay on the particular topic that I, I started up with. Well, you are the one that's been guiding. I'm just going off what you said. Yeah, but you're not you brought staying. Up, you brought up Genesis 1-1, not me. Yeah. I'm, uh, and I said should earlier... Be, Colossians 1 and John 1 3. So I'm not going anywhere different than what I've already shared. You are, you're not staying on the topic of, of what the word God means. But you can't see that. You, you've already, you've well, already spoken several times that the word Elohim doesn't always apply to the Almighty. We've already so established that. Saying, That's old news, Ben. Now we're talking but, about who is the creator. Who the is creator, the creator of all things? 
The creator of all things is Jehovah, not Jesus. He is the yet, master worker. Who, he is the John master. John one three says otherwise, Ben. Uh, that's not what John one three says in the Greek. Really? Yep. There's oh. a word there. Which, there's, there's a word there which you keep getting wrong in it's, in many Bibles. In, let me. I've got to go off and find. Oh, don't worry. I'll help um, you out. I'm going to help you out a lot here. We're going to we're going to go to the Greek so that would be no confusion, and you can't accuse me of doing anything with Trinitarianism. We're going to go right to your Kingdom and a Linear translation of John one three, and here's what it says on the screen. I'll read it out loud. All things through Him came to be, and apart from Him came to be not but one thing. Help me out, Ben. Okay. The word through, what does that mean? Ben, it says, apart from him came yeah, to be uh, not, uh, okay. on, not but one thing. Was there anything that ever came into existence without Jesus? Yes or no? Apart, apart from Jesus. Is Jesus a thing? He is apart from the things other things made. That's not what it says here. It does. It does. No, it, no, it does not. You're reading into it, my friend. No, I'm not reading into it. All things. This is talking about creation. All things came into being, or all things through him came to be, apart from him came to be not but one thing. So nothing that's ever come into existence came into existence without Jesus. There's no say, other there's no other he, here. And it does it doesn't say without Jesus. He says apart from Jesus. Brain uh Ben, you're smarter than that. No you're smarter you, than that. You're listen. 67. Apart from him Nothing, not one thing came into existence. So if Jesus is a part of something that's created, then John just contradicted what he says. No, he doesn't. You're right, he doesn't, because Jesus created apart all from, things, and Jesus apart is Apart from him. All things, it doesn't say Jesus created, it says all things it came says, into existence. Okay. When Listen. it says all things, tell me what that means, all things. All things apart from Jesus came into existence <laughs> through Jesus. No, it doesn't say that. It does. No, it doesn't. All things through him came apart from. <laughs> Read the oh, word Kukuris. Give me the New World Translation down the road, Ben. No, it says all things through him came to be, period. Apart from him came to be nothing. In other words, Everything that's ever come to existence has come through him. Nothing has ever come to existence has come without him. Therefore, he's the creator, Ben. Yeah, I, I, he isn't. He is. Uh, Jesus did the work. All things were created through the agency of Jesus. That's what the word dia means. In you got in look look at your interlinear. You've got uh, Panta Dia Artu Geneto Egento uh, Panta O Dia Through. The through there means an agency. You know what? That's right, Ben. That's what confirms the Trinity, Ben, because there is Father, Son, and and Holy Spirit, who all three work together in the issue of creation. That helps build my case, not yours. Well, it doesn't because it, it, he came through. God set the set. If I, if you're going to go go build a house, have you, you ever built a house? No, I have never built a house. I am definitely okay. not that talented. No, no way. Okay, so so. You decide now you want to build a house. You go to a builder and you say, can you build me a house? 
the builder builds you your beautiful new house and you say to your friends, come see the house that I built. <laughs> and your friends come to you and say, wow, what a lovely house you built. Who built it for you? And you say, builder so-and-so did it. Now, if you said but, I was the only one who built my house, well, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? But if you said the house that I built, but then you had other people involved, then that would also point to some kind of unity. That's what the Bible teaches, Ben. All right, just one quick question. Whoever you are coming in the background and, and the sin, go away or I'll ban you. This is a discussion between me and Ben. The link is up there for Ben just in case he gets lost connection. So don't come back up here, whoever you are trying to come up here. If you come up here again, I'm going to ban you. Okay, go ahead, Ben. So when you built your house, you did it through an, the agency of a builder. When so here's the, the thing, ben, you, you, as, as a Trinitarian, as understanding Genesis 1-1, one, one, Genesis 1-2, Job 33-4, Nehemiah 9-6, Isaiah 44-24, John 1-3, Colossians 1, 16, 17, Hebrews 1, 2, Hebrews are, um, um, yeah, these different scriptures, oh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, these various scriptures that talk about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we see this unity working together. The Bible is very clear, God is the creator. So either, either we have a contradiction, which me and you don't believe is there, this we at least have a common ground. But the other thing is this, either this points to Jesus being the creator, like what the New World Translation footnote says of Colossians 1.16, it says, because if that word other there, it'll give the reader the impression that Jesus is actually the creator. So if we just read it for what it says, Ben, we're going to get the impression that Jesus is the creator. So why don't we just read God's word for what it says and believe what God's word says? Because you got to understand what the words mean in the big, to start off with. You can't. I'm finding this very frustrating because I can't get the point across, or you, you, you can't see the point that I'm trying to make. I get that, Ben. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. That I don't want to be rude. The problem, Ben, is, I'll just be frank, is because you have an unbiblical position because scripture teaches Jesus is the very one who created all things. You can't escape that, Ben. The source of all creation is Jehovah. Jesus was his master worker who did the work. All things came through the agency of Jesus. Now, I don't know how in America you go about doing tax returns. I used to be a tax agent. So people would come to me with their material to lodge their tax returns. I would be their agent for them to get the work done. So you would come to me and say, here, Ben, here's all my years, all my years financials. I need to lodge a, lodge a tax return. You prepare it and lodge it for me. I'm now your agent. You're the source of the material. You've pr pr provided me with all the documentation. I put it all together and I lodged the final product to the uh, to the government. That's the situation with creation. God, Jehovah, is the source of all creation. He works with his son, Jesus, who was created, the very first of all creation, as uh, Hebrew, Colossians 1.15 says, and um, Revelation uh, 3.14, Jesus was the very first of all creation. And God says to Jesus, okay, I've got work to be done. Here's all the materials. Here's the plans. You go ahead and do it for me. Or we'll do it together. So Jesus becomes the agent that God used in creation. And that's what John 1 verse 3 is telling us. That Jesus, was in, the, in John 1 1, Jesus was actually face to face with the God.
but he was not the God. He had the qualities of being God. That means he had, he was a mighty one. He had the same quality of being mighty, with being powerful and having strength. So John 1, 1, Jesus is with the God. That's what the, the Greek says. He was proston theon, with God. But then it says uh, theos was God. In English, God was, uh, the word was, was God. Good job, so, Ben. The word was God. The word, that, that's the Greek, not the English. Oh, well, actually, in the literal translation, even the Kingman Linear, it says the same thing what you just said there. How about that? The word A is implied. No, it's well, not. It isn't. It, or it is. No, it's not. It's, it, it's the Greek grammar that you've got to employ. You've got to put the A in there. So let me give you a response now. You've talked for a couple minutes. So back to the tax thing. So nobody who ever gets their taxes would ever say, oh, I did my own taxes. So you use the false premise to use the word agency. When I get my taxes done, I take it somewhere, I take it to someone and they do it. I don't take any credit for it. I had nothing to do with it other than just provide information for sure. But I'm definitely not the brains or the source or anything. I'm just giving them information and data, right? So that was a wrong analogy to use. Um, in regards, again, back to the content of what we've been saying, this is what scripture says, Ben. Whether you agree with it, you disagree with it, you struggle with it, you're frustrated, whatever you want to say, it says all things came into being through Jesus, John 1, 3. There's no escaping that. No escaping that. The Watchtower, I just showed you on the screen a minute ago and read it out loud, the Watchtower openly acknowledges that if the word other, which it's not in the Greek, they added it in the New World Translation now. They've even removed the brackets, even worse deception now. At least when they had the brackets before, it was something, at least you go, okay. But the word other, not there, they at least say, you know what? The reader is going to get the impression, could get the impression, wow, Jesus is actually not, the cre not created, but the creator. Another point that you made that's wrong, you talked about Revelation 3.14. I've got Greek scholarship. That would back up what I'm about to tell you here. Uh, Thayer would say here in reference to the word protos, talks about origin, anything that begins to be origin, active cause. A.T. Robertson talks about the originating source. We've got Swanson, James Swanson, Dictionary of Biblical Languages, talks about Revelation 3.14, states the first cause or the origin. Known as what's called the B DAG, which everyone goes, Oh, so excited for B DAG. Talking here, it talks about the first cause or the beginning in reference to all of things coming to existence. So, even though people so often try to quote Revelation, they're saying, Look, this is the beginning where Jesus first created. No, what that's actually stating, he's actually the cause, the beginning of all things that brings creation into existence. If that was not the case, the same Greek words and text is used in Revelation 22, 13 that you believe as a Jehovah Witness is only speaking about Jehovah God that says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. The beginning there is the same Greek there as it is in Revelation 3, 14. So if you're going to say Revelation 3, 14 is talking about the beginning of something coming into existence, then you would also then have to acknowledge that you believe Jehovah God at some point came into existence because that's the same text in the Greek as Revelation twenty two thirteen. Nope, because the exactly. grammar is different. The, 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 the grammar job. is different. The, the grammar, no, it's, the, no, it's the exact the same. Grammar, nope, don't agree because the grammar is different. How is it different, Ben? Um, I'm just trying to pull up um, to. I've got to go to. Uh, I don't think what program I've got to pull up. Um, um, B -I -B -L -E -H -G. I'm just typing on the computer to get a something up.
Well, I'm going to help you out in just a second here since you're not doing too well. I'm going to help you out and show it to you in the Bible in a linear. Is that good? Uh, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at uh, Bible interlinear. Uh, Revelation. All right. So I'm going to show All it to right. you on the screen. And I'll read it out loud so people can see it here. Okay. So here it is, the beginning. Right here you can see, well, right here, the Greek, Anarche, the beginning. See how it shows right here, little n, whatever thing up here, then the APXN. And I go right over here then to Revelation 22, 13. And wow, the beginning. Same exact Greek yep. in all of its glory, Ben. So what I'm trying to tell oh. you is if you're going to use the case that Jesus is supposed to be created according to Revelation 3, 14, well, that doesn't teach, by mind you, Greek scholarship would go against that. Then you have uh, to say I'd... the same thing applies in Revelation twenty two thirteen. You have to. I I fully disagree with you about the uh, the word arche arch in Revelation three fourteen. Absolutely, Tell me why. Fully because of the Greek grammar. I'm just trying to find the information that I've got here on it. Well, I just um, showed online. It's the same Greek. Nothing different. Now, you can say you believe it's different context. I could agree with you that that's where you may come from, but you can't say it's different Greek. Are you still there, Ben? Ben? Did we lose you again, Ben? Yikes. Number three. All right, Ben's back up. Ben, you, you with can us? hear me? Yes, Ben, I can hear you. I don't know what I, I don't know where I was when I lost when I lost the connection. What was I talking about? <laughs> can I make a joke or what? Gonna... <laughs> well, I'm just trying to remember what I was up to. So, in a nutshell, Ben, what I was sharing before, which I think you were starting to try to respond to, was in the Greek of Revelation 3.14, in Revelation 22.13, of the beginning, same words, same exact words. All that I was saying before is there's Greek scholarship. There's Greek scholarship that talks about that. The beginning can have the meaning of cause or origin. But if you have the view that you want to go with as a Jehovah's Witness, believing otherwise, then the same Greek that's in there is also in Revelation 22 which then you would have to take the same application if you're going to be consistent to say that the father is also been, if you're believing that's only the father, then that would imply he was at some point created too. That's where you're trying to respond to. Go ahead. Okay. What I was, uh, now I've, uh, I'm just, the, I disagree with those scholars you read out because they ignored the grammar of the text. They went on their theological um, ideas, and they completely ignored How, the. So, so ben, not, not to be rude, you're 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 implying that these are just Greek dictionaries and theologians. They're giving you what the words actually mean. So you can't you can't just say they're going off of their theology. You can't just say that. As far as Revelation three verse fourteen is concerned, from what you read out, I can. Okay. Because. Well, then, so, so that makes you superior to people who are actual scholars. Okay, go ahead. No, because they they ignore their own work. No, they're they don't. Their... That's an, that's that's just a you're just throwing words out there now, Ben. But keep going. Okay, let me just uh, twenty two verse thirteen. Oh, I lost it. How about we go back? You look, look. We're at about an hour and forty minutes now. We've been going for a bit. We kind of gotten off track. I mean, you you can go on this if you want. It's it's up to you. It's up to you. I just know that I'm starting to get tired myself here, and um, I don't want to keep here longer than you want to be. So, do you want to maybe go back to a point that we were talking about before, or do you want to maybe give some additional information? 
we've, we've tried it. We, we've talked about a lot of things and covered nothing. Well, I think we covered a lot, but we have talked we, about we, a lot too. We've talked about a lot, but we've actually covered nothing. In your it's, opinion, I, I think we've um, covered quite a bit. Um, we, you've, we haven't covered anything, but we haven't. Uh, I, I'm trying to put that into in the right sort of words. Um, come on, computer. It's not, there we go. Revelations. You've been a witness for all your life, man. I've been a Christian since the age of six. We don't need computers, man. Just just talk. I need the computer to be able to go to the Greek language of the Bible or the Hebrew language of the Bible. For what verse? Because the, 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 the beginning. Okay. I, I can well, try and help uh, you. If you like, I just, you uh, I just, uh, I just confirmed what I was trying to think. You were saying that the the word archai is used in Revelation three verse fourteen and Revelation twenty two verse thirteen. I agree with you, but three, the grammar four, three, three fourteen and twenty two thirteen, correct? Yes. Yeah, but the grammar is different. The grammar is quite different in each each text. In when you Revelation, say, what do you mean? The words which go along that go with it. Um, do you know much about Greek at all? I'm not a scholar, but I know enough to at least examine things. What are you trying to say, Ben? Uh, well, do you know that in Greek they have um, there's cases, there's a genitive case, the non nominative sure. case, sure. accusative sure. case. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Okay. And now all those words affect the meaning of a text. Sure, and also context also affects the text. Yeah, yeah but the, the context comes from the meaning from the from the particular words used. In Re Revelation 3, verse 14, what we have there is a, a the word archi, archi is uh -huh. followed by a genitive expression. Uh-huh. Okay. What's that point? What does that prove? That it was when it comes with a genitive in the Bible, it is always translated as beginning every instance well, where says the beginning i agree no in every instance where the word arche is followed by the word by a genitive expression it always is translated as beginning okay so in revelation 3 verse 14 it talks that it literally says that jesus is the beginning of creation nope that's what the greek says it says he's the beginning of the creation of God, and we already know that John is already who is wrote the Gospel of John. No, I'm, no, I said Revelation. I said Revelation three. I know, no. I said Revelation three. John is the same guy who wrote the Gospel of John, correct? Yep. Yes. So when he says in John one three, nothing came into being without Jesus. And then we see in Revelation 3, 14 that he is the beginning of the creation of God. We can see, and when you look up the word the beginning, Greek scholarship says and demonstrates that he's talking about the beginning. The beginning of what? The creation of all things. Therefore, he's the source for all of creation. I agree that Jehovah is the source of all creation, not Jesus. And in John 1, 1, it is not talking about the beginning of all creation. It's talking about the beginning of of everything after Jesus, from that, and you get that because of Colossians one fifteen and Revelation three fourteen. Actually, you're wrong, Ben. When you look at John one one, the first clause, en arche en ha lagos, the word "ain" there in Greek has the meaning of the word "was" an infinite time period, meaning before there ever was anything, the word has always been talking about eternity and the word was with god proston theon meaning he was with the father from eternity and then the word was god and then he was with god in the beginning and then we get to john 1 3 we learn more about the word the eternal logos everything came into existence through the word the word became flesh and dwelt among us who is jesus jesus is eternal 
Jesus is with the Father from the very beginning of all of eternity, and Jesus is the very one who created all things. That's the context of what John is teaching. Okay. It's getting late. My family want lunch. Okay. If I'm trying to speak. Before you and, go, Ben, I, I, yeah. Yeah, before you go, I want to first off say thank you for taking the time to spend it with me, even though we went back and forth and, and you know, debating this. Not many people who are an active Jehovah's Witness would actually go out of their way to try and come online and do something like this. So I want to say thank you very much for being here, and I want to show you respect, even though we still don't agree, and I believe you're wrong, and you believe I'm wrong, but we both believe the Bible is right, and I want to show that respect yep. to you. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay. I hope that you um, enjoyed being here, Ben, and I thank you for taking the time to be here. Okay. Catch you a bit later. All right, Ben. Talk to yep. you later. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Well, welcome here. Thank you for being here, guys. I hope that, uh, I really hope that Ben at some point becomes a Christian and gets out of the watchtower and trusts in the biblical Jesus. Amen. All right, guys. What did you guys think of the conversation? Type it out. I'm